Well, welcome to Math 143 Online. This will be the first lecture um, video that we're going to do for the semester. So let's, you know, dive right into it. Um, these videos I'm going to be piecing together um, lectures about the topics that we're going to be covering and um, ideas on how to deal with spreadsheets, even though I have a bunch of short videos on that anyways. Um, that's relative to the topic that we're going to be discussing. Um, and other hints that you might need to know before you start doing your work in Mobius. So let's start off with the first topic, which is, uh, I just title it Large Numbers. And um, with large numbers, we're going to do scientific notation. Uh, one of the things you need to know about me is, especially when I'm talking and writing at the same time, I have a hard time spelling to begin with. So if you see any spelling mistakes, just ignore them. All right, so when we're talking about large numbers, the one that um, I came across today was uh, Jeff Bezos. He's the uh, founder of Amazon and makes tons of money. Um, I saw a news article that said he was going to be worth one trillion dollars. Um, by 2023, if things go on track for Amazon being as popular as it is. And a lot of people see this number, $1 trillion, and they're like, that's a lot of money, and, which it is. And um, what I wanted to do is break it down into something that's a little bit more understandable. So $1 trillion can be written this way. It has a lot of zeros after it. So this is how much he would be worth after, um, by this article, by 2023. So just a, a refresher memory about terminology about large numbers. Um, these are the hundreds. These three are the thousands. These three are the millions. Oh, I didn't make it big enough. Isn't that sad? Even I have a hard time with large numbers. So I'm going to have to erase here. D -d -d. You have to wonder sometimes if I do this on purpose. Oh, I have to go back to my other color. Um, I need three more zeros. And a one. All right, so then these three, if those are the millions, these are the billions. And then way up here at the end, that would be our trillions. So... It kind of gives you an idea that having a trillion dollars for a single individual just seems eh, kind of ridiculous. So let's break this up into what could he do? Well, um, each one of these three zeros represents a thousand. So if we, um, well, I shouldn't say we, we should say if Jeff decided to be generous with his money, he could make a thousand people, 1,000 people, he could make billionaires. And a billionaire was very rare up until the last 20 or 30 years. And now they're like everywhere, I guess. All right, so he could make a, oops, I don't even know how to write a thousand. I'm doing really bad this morning. He could make a thousand people billionaires. All right, and then those billionaires, if I take these three zeros, they could make a thousand people millionaires. Now, you know, being a millionaire is pretty cool. Um, so basically a thousand thousand people could be millionaires. So that's a thousand thousand people. So they could... Jeff Bezos, on his own, could make a million millionaires. Pretty impressive that he could change the lives of a million people by giving away all his money. To put that even in a stranger way, there's about 315 million people in the U.S., give or take a little bit. 
So if you if Jeff Bezos could make a million millionaires, that's like one out of uh, 315 people. So for every 315 people in this country, he could make a millionaire. Kind of a, a crazy amount of money. So having someone being worth this much is just, you know, in my opinion, and I'm quite sure in many others, a little bit ludicrous. All right. So um, dealing with large numbers gets kind of confusing, especially when we start talking about the entire world or the entire country or even just the entire state of North Carolina. So to help out with the calculations, if we have, you know, some large number, eh, I'm just making up a number here. Um, and we want to, you know, do some things to this. Uh, we can change it into scientific notation. Now, scientific notation requires you to know where the decimal point is. So if we're talking about a whole number, you go to the far right, you put in a decimal, and just for fun, put in a zero to force your eyes to see where that decimal is. And then scientific notation is just literally counting how many decimal places until you can get in between the first two whole, uh, the first two whole numbers. Yeah. That sounds pretty good. So we're going to have to move this. That would be two, that would be three, that would be four, that would be five. And eventually we get to this position here and that would be six. So we can write this number as 2.358. Uh, and if you want, 731. But then we're gonna write times 10 to the sixth power. Now that times 10 to the sixth power is just representing that motion of decimals from where it was to where we put it. So generally the six is going to be positive when we write this as a smaller number, you know, 2.3 is much smaller than 2.3 million. Um, we have to balance it off by multiplying it by a big number. And that combination brings you back to the original number. So the opposite would happen if you um, took a very, very small number, 0 0.000138, and we wanted to use scientific notation on this. Nice thing about decimal numbers is they automatically have the decimal point in place. So we're going to move this decimal, one, two, three, four, moving it between the first counting number and it, the next whole number. All right, so this is going to become 1.38. So now we've taken a really small number and made it bigger. So we're going to balance it off by multiplying by 10 to the, and we moved it one, two, three, four times. And I'm gonna write negative four. So if you ever do a calculation on your calculator and you end up with a number that looks like 1.4739218, and it has an E here and a number after it. That is not an error on your calculator. Um, the modern ones will actually say like domain error or calculate error or um, syntax error is the other one. So this E really represents times 10 to the, and in this case, six. So it's 1.4739218 times 10 to the sixth power, which makes this number rather uh, big. And if it was negative six, the number would be rather small because this times 10 to the sixth says, take this decimal point and move it six times to the right. And if it was negative six, you would move it six times to the left. All right. So on a calculator, if we want to start working with these large numbers, for instance, um, let's do an example right off the bat. Um, let's say that, um, let's kind of go backwards. Uh, your family of four uh, uses uh, two gallons of milk per week. Um, assuming that all families use 
use around the same amount. How much milk is consumed per year? Okay. So there's a few things in this word problem we have to kind of break out. Um, let's assume that there's that 315 million people in the U.S., and let's also assume that this 350 million people break up into family units of a size of four. And then, of course, the assumption is they're going to be using two gallons of milk per week. And we know these assumptions are kind of um, very loose because some families are bigger and some are smaller um, and some are just individuals out there. All right, but just, you know, go with it and see where this assumption leads us. So if there's 315 million people in the country, um, what we have to determine is how many families of four are in that 315 million people. So we're going to do 315 million, and I'm just going to write M-I-L here. We'll change it in a second. And we're going to divide it by four because out of those 315 million people, for grouping them in as fours, that's the same thing as dividing by four. All right, so now we need to know what to do on a calculator. So let's talk about this based on a calculator. Let's go with bright orange. So on a calculator, if you want to enter, let me go back a page, 3.315 uh, 3, million people easily, you can write 315 and then you have to be really, really careful with the numbers of zeros you put after it. And most mistakes that people make are in typing either more zeros than you need and the more common mistake of less zeros than you need. Kind of like my first trillion dollars, I was missing uh, three zeros in it. So an easier way to deal with this is to change it into scientific notation or what's also known as engineering notation. And it depends on which way you want to go. If we're going to do scientific notation, we need that decimal point. So we'll, at the end of the number, put a decimal zero. And we're going to move that decimal three, six, seven, eight. So this is going to become 3.15 uh, times 10 to the eighth. Um, the other way of doing it is just dealing with the zeros. So another way of writing this is 315 times 10 to the 6. Now, times 10 to the 6 is another way of saying million. Um, by the way, 10 to the 9th, three more zeros, this would be million. This would be billion. And 10 to the 12th, that would be trillion. Um, so that's considered engineering notation. So if you want to use that, that's fine. Um, the rest of my lesson is going to be based on scientific notation. All right, so I want to be able to type this divided by 4 into the calculator. So the first thing you're going to type in, obviously, is going to be 3.15. All right, so after you type those in, you're going to want to put in the times 10 to the 8th. So to get the times 10 to the, you're going to hit second, and then you're going to hit this button right here. Now notice the EE -E up here above it. The EE -E represents times 10 to the. All right, so you're going to go second EE, -E, and then you're going to type in the 8, the power of 8. So in a calculator, it's going to look like this, 3.15. On the screen, it'll just give you a single E, even though the button has E. Now, where I'm looking for that E is that up, when you hit the second, it's the stuff above that you're really doing. So you're not doing X to the negative 1. You're doing second X to the negative 1, which is E. -E. So 3.15 E8 will show up on your screen, and then you divide it by 4. So if I do that on my calculator, 3.15 EE8 e, uh, divided by 4, I'm getting, uh, no, 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 
this becomes 7.875 uh, times 10 to the seventh, also known as E7. So these two things are mean the same thing, uh, times 10 to the seventh. All right, so that would be how many households of families of four. How many families of four we're talking about here? So let's go back to my problem. So this is equal to 7.875. I'm going to write it in calculator notation, E7. Okay, so that tells me how many families. All right, then we have to figure out, now we need to find out how many gallons of milk these families are going to consume. And, and notice down here it says per week. So each one of these families is going to use two gallons of milk every single week. So that basically just means I'm going to take my number of families and multiply it by my two gallons to come up with... Uh, how much we got. So I'm just going to go times two in my calculator. I already had the other number in there. And I'm getting 1.575E8. And this is gallons per week. All right. Well, that's a lot of milk, but we're not even done yet because this is only every single week. So there's about 52 weeks in a year. So I'm going to turn around and multiply this thing by 52. All right, so in my calculator, the number is still sitting there, times 52. This becomes 8.19E9. And now I can answer the question, how much milk is consumed per year? Because now we're down to gallons and we've changed weeks into years. Now this 8.19E9 is 819. That takes care of two of the nine, the, this nine I'm talking about. So now we're down to seven. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And I can double check myself by putting that decimal point there and then counting to make sure. One, two, three, Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, which would put it as 8.19. I can get rid of that. And then I'm going to put in my commas because it makes it a lot easier to read. So remember, this is hundreds, this is thousands, this is millions, and this is billions. So this 8.1919E9 is 8.19 billion gallons. Per year. So, and this is when we start talking about outrageous numbers when we start talking, you know, extrapolating this to the entire population. The same thing happens with uh, gasoline, sugar, oil, electricity, um, anything that everybody commonly uses in their house, you have to kind of be able to think about it as, well, what if we looked at the entire country this way? And the numbers usually just get really, really large. All right, so one thing I alluded to with even uh, the big number calculations was the idea of unit conversions. And you've probably seen one of these charts someplace lying around uh, back in grade school or something like that. And I just want to describe how these things are used. So as long as you have, um, let's go with pounds and ounces, why not? So as long as you have, as long as you have a conversion like one pound is equal to 16 ounces. One thing that'll always be true in mathematics that if you divide the same by the same, then that answer is going to be one. Um, everything disappears and it just becomes the numeral one, which is also known as, you know, the multiplicative identity, in case you're really curious. 
So what we do is we use this idea that they're equal to each other to create a ratio of the same amount divided by the same amount, and that'll just always be one, and one times anything, you know, is itself. So for example, if I have uh, 17 pounds, and I wanna know um, how many ounces, And the word ounce is a strange thing because there's the fluid ounce and then there's the weight measurement ounce. Personally, I wish they chose two different words for it, but this is the English measurement system and it makes no sense whatsoever. All right, so if we're gonna convert 17 pounds into ounces, and I know some of you are gonna be like, well, you just do this. And the problem with guessing at an operation is half the time you're right, Eh, half the time you're wrong, and I'd rather you do it a way that always gives you the right answer and it's going to lead into more difficult conversions. Um, you're used to doing what's called one-step conversions, and I'm going to get you up to at least four, if not more. So the first thing you do is you start off with what you have, and I have 17 pounds. Now, if there's not another unit in it, which would make it a rate, um, you just put a one under the bottom. So you want to create a fraction, a ratio, and we're going to multiply that by another ratio, but it's going to be of this type, same over same, so it's equal to one. And the way I'm going to set it up is I want to get rid of pounds, so the first thing I'm going to write is pounds in the bottom, because I know if we have same over same, the answer is one, and pounds over pounds will give you a one. Now, above the pounds, I want to change it into ounces. Um, I think the abbreviation is OZ. And there are 16 ounces per every one pound. So that's how this ratio is going to get used. It's going to, um, this equality is going to get used as a ratio down here in my conversion. So when I go through this conversion, I'm going to say, well, the pounds are going to go away because they're just going to become one. And the operation that exists between two numbers in the numerator is going to be multiplication. So I know I'm going to have to multiply those two numbers. So let's see here, 16 times 17. Well, actually, the order was 17 times 16. So that's 272. So this becomes 272 ounces. So 17 pounds is the same thing as 272 ounces. And that's really all there is to unit conversions. As long as you have an equality between two different measurements, you can always create a conversion ratio. All right, so let's try a different one from the table. Uh, let's say we have um, gallons. Why not? So we have, let's say we have three gallons of something, milk, whatever. Um, and I want to know how many uh, pints. Oh, let's even go further, cups. All right. So we have three gallons, and we want to know how many cups is in this three gallons. So we'll start off the same start with what you know and what I know or what I have on hand is three gallons and because it's not a rate I'll put it over one times now I need to get rid of gallons so that's gonna go in the bottom GAL what I can convert it to by the chart I only have a relationship between gallons and quarts up here at the top so if I only have a relationship between gallons and quarts, I can only change this into quarts. Even though I'm looking for cups, I don't have that jumping ability to go all the way to cups because I don't know how many cups are in a gallon. So for every gallon, there are four quarts. All right, and then by the conversion chart, I want to get rid of quarts. So, so far my gallons are gone, one in the top, one at the bottom. So I'm going to put my quarts at the bottom so that they'll be able to cancel. And I can change quarts right here into pints. So there are 
two pints for one quart. Um, PT? There are two pints per one quart. I don't remember my English abbreviations. It's kind of sad. All right, and then now we're down to how many pints we have because the gallons will cancel and the quarts will cancel. I might as well just do it right now and get it out of the way. So the gallons are gone, the quarts are gone, and all the measurements that we have left, and that's another nice thing about this unit conversion, is when you do it, whatever units are left are your units of measure. So right now, the only units of measure left is pint. All right, and then we'll go back up to my chart. For every pint, there are two cups. So again, I want to get rid of pints, so that's going to go in the bottom, and cups in the top, and there are two cups for every one pint. And therefore, uh, the pints will cancel, and all that we have left is this cups. Now each one of the numbers, the three, the four, the two, and the two, they're all in the numerators of these fractions. So the only operation between all of them is gonna be multiplication. So it's gonna be three times four, which is 12, times two, which is 24, times another two, which is, oops, wrong color, 48. So there are 48 cups, oops, cups, in three gallons of liquids. And this is a four-step conversion because we've gone down the chart uh, enough steps to find out our answer. So how about this question? Now here I have 100 yards is how many miles? Now notice I put many in quotations here because 100 yards, if we go back up to the top, um, the relationship between yards and miles is you need 1760 of them to come up with a single mile and obviously a hundred miles is not 1760 but we're going to use that uh, relationship so again we start off with what we have a hundred yards we'll put it over one and we're going to multiply it by something that has yards in the bottom so that the two yards will cancel and I'm going to use that relationship to change it into miles. So there's 1,760 yards for every single mile. So like if a uh, football player takes off at one end of an end zone and ends up at the other end of an end zone, how many miles did he go? We know he went 100 yards. So we're going to have a, some measurements cancel. The yards are going to go away. And the only, only unit of measure left over is miles. So this is what's different between this example and the previous two. The previous two had all the um, numbers that were not one in the numerator. And this last one has uh, a number in the denominator. And we have to figure out what to do with it. So the operation for all the ones in the numerator were multiplication. But if you have a number in the bottom, if we you know, simplified this, you'd multiply across the top, that would be 100 miles divided by 1760. And that's the hint. If you have a number in the bottom, you're going to divide. So let's see here, 100 divided by 1760 gives us about 0 0.06. This is equal to 0 0.06. And when I put the MI here, usually you would say miles, but it would be 0 0.06 of a mile because it's not a whole mile. So that would be 100 yards is about 6 hundredths of a mile. I think some of the confusion between converting units is a lot of the times you have an idea on how to do it. Um, and I just want to emphasize that you really don't want to just take guesses at this stuff. So let's take an unknown relationship that I'm making up totally weird units of measure. So I have three killers, my, my nickname, uh, is equal to two, uh, 20 Sammies, my daughter. Um, and this is just some weird measurement system. It doesn't even matter what it measures. So my question is, um, 
How many? Sammies. Uh, R in uh, 12 killers. And I just want to use this as a, a strange example to get our heads away from measurements that we already know. So again, you start off with what you have, which is 12 killers, not Manson's. Uh, and you put it over one, it's not a rate. And you're gonna multiply this by something that has killers in the bottom. And we wanna change it into Sammy's. And the only relationship between killers and Sammy's is this up here. So there's going to be three of those, three me's, and 20 of my daughters. And this tells us what relationship there is, and it tells us how to convert it. So the killers are gonna go away, yay. And we're going to be left with Sammy's. Now the operations here get a little bit more confusing. Not all in the numerator, not one in the numerator, one in the denominator. So we're gonna to have to do the operations. You can do them in order, out of order, because it's all multiplication and division. So I'm going to do it as 12 times 20 divided by three. Anything in the top is going to get multiplied. Once it's in the bottom, you can just go divide by, divide by, divide by as many times as you want. And this will give us an answer. 12 times 20 divided by three. So this turns into eight. I left off an M, oh well. This would be 80 Sammies. So if there are three, uh, I'm sorry, 12 killers, then there's 80 Sammies. So this is how I want you to use these unit conversions. You have to find some kind of equality between the two measurement systems and then set that up as a ratio in the correct order. Um, if I started off with 12 Sammies over here instead of the 12 killers and I want to convert, you know, a different problem, then on this side, the Sammies would have to be in the bottom. The killers would have to be in the top. And I know there are three killers for every 20 Sammies. So here the operation would be 12 times 3. And then we're going to divide that because the 20 is in the bottom. And the only thing left over is the killers. So this would be the unit measurement of killers. So that's, uh, oh, let's see what this is. So be 6 divided by 20 is 1.8. So in this case, there would be 1.8 killers is the same thing as 12 sixes. One of the um, conversion things that are on this chart, it kind of doesn't fit with all the rest of them, you know, pounds to ounces and cups to teaspoons and yards and feet and miles. But this one right here, I put in there especially because I have a lot of problems built around it. If you um, get into the medical field, or for that matter, science field, everything is measured in kilograms or grams because it is a much easier unit to work with and it's a slightly different um, meaning than pounds. Pounds um, is something you weigh. So uh, if I weigh 200 pounds on the planet Earth, on the moon, I actually weigh less because the moon is smaller and it has a smaller gravitational pull. But kilograms, if I weighed 200 kilograms on the planet Earth, I would also have, I, you can't even say weigh, have a mass of 200 kilograms on the earth, then your mass on the moon is exactly the same. So they do this conversion to get rid of um, any fluctuations in um, gravitational pull. So the medical field switches over to kilograms uh, and it's one kilogram equals about 2.2 pounds. Um, there's a little bit more on the decimal end, but we're just gonna use 2.2. So, um, if Jerry weighs, uh, 230 pounds, how many kilograms? Okay. So just like, um, earlier, we're going to 
start with what we have. And what we have is 230 pound Jerry. We'll put them over one. And we're gonna multiply so that pounds is in the second position. And we wanna change it into kilograms so that my pounds will go away, which is nice. All right, and what we want. So now the relationship between kilograms and pounds is 2.2 pounds, so I'll put that down here. Oops, 2.2 pounds is equal to one kilogram. So the operation that exists between 230 and 2.2 is division. So this will be 230 divided by 2.2, and this will be in kilograms. 200, oops, 230 divided by 2.2. So this is 104.5 kilograms. So personally, I'd rather be weighed in kilograms than pounds. The number gets smaller. The metric system, you had to be anticipating it. It's really not as bad as it seems. Um, it's been in our education system since the 50s, and mostly because, again, scientists, medical fields, um, lean more towards the metric system because it's easier to do conversions, and there is a relationship between um, length and volume, uh, and that also, uh, the volume gives mass. So everything's interconnected when you're talking about the metric system. Where in the English units, it gets really messy when you try to go from length to uh, a volume and a volume to mass. It, it's just really horrible. So with the metric system, there is a base measurement. Now the base measurement depends on if it's liters for volume, uh, grams for mass, and meters. So we have liters, grams, and meters. Now, liters, I said, was volume, how much space something takes up. Grams is a mass. You can convert it into a weight, but it's a pain. Uh, meters is just a length or a distance. All right, so that would become your base measurement. Now, from the base measurement, you're going to get smaller cuts of a meter. So we're gonna, uh, it's kind of like if you take a yard and a yard is equal to three feet, you're cutting a yard into three different pieces. Um, what the metric system did is kept it kind of simple based on our number system, which is base 10. When you get smaller, you're going to get deci. Now it takes 10 decis to make one base. We'll come back to that in a second. And then there's centi which basically means it takes a hundred cent as in a hundred pennies or century as in a hundred years. Uh, cent is going to be a hundred of the base or it takes a hundred cents to make up one base. And then there's milli. I always forget if there's one L or two Ls. Uh, now when we get bigger, I usually um, change the letter and I think they do too. There's deca. And then there's hecto. So if you have a hectometer, you have a um, hundred meters. If you have a decameter, you have 10 meters. And then of course there's the kilo, and a kilo means a thousand. All right, so here's how the system, if I have, for example, um, 450 centimeters, and I want to convert it into something else. So we're starting, let me put a color in here. Oh, let's go with something different, orange. We're starting here. So if I move to a bigger measurement, that's the direction my decimal, kind of like with scientific notation, I'm going to be moving a decimal point because each one of these is only off by a factor of 10. So if I want to make, ask how many decimeters there are, then this would be, um, 445 decimeters. If I wanted to find out how many meters it is, I would have to move once and twice to get to the base. So this would equal 
4.5 meters because I would have to take that decimal place and move it two positions. So um, it is kind of a cool system. So let's say we have 38.4 hectoliters. All right, so hectoliters is here. And I want to find out how many liters it is. All right, I use a cursive L. Um, I think you're supposed to use like a small L, but I'll use a cursive. So to go from hecta to base, which is where the liters would be, I'm going to need to move the two decimal places literally to the right. So this is going to be 384 is one motion of the decimal and a zero. So 38.4 hectoliters is 3,840 liters. So that's how you use that setup here to find out um, where your decimal place is going to move and how to convert one unit into the next. I know there's some kind of acronym that goes like King Henry drinks milk, blah, blah, blah. I could never remember that one. Um, if you can find it, find it. It's very common to hear about square units, um, especially if you're buying like floor covering like rugs or um, laminate. So square units conversions becomes kind of important because it used to be measured in square yards and um, until recently it started switching over to square feet and there's a reason that they did that. So let's start off with what is a square yard. So if I have one square yard, what that represents is an area. And areas are a two-dimensional kind of measurement. So when you have one square yard, you literally have a square that measures one yard on a side. And the amount of stuff inside this square yard is called the one square yard. It's hard to describe because it's just a, a geometric shape. So it's the interior of the square that has this measurement of one square yard, and the outside is one yard per side. All right, so rugs used to be sold this way. So you would have like um, uh, a price for it. It would be something like $38 per square yard. Now, unlike um, earlier when we were converting pounds into kilograms and so forth and so on, we were just dealing with a singular unit. This thing is not called a unit. This is called a rate. And it's got a rate because it has two different measurements built into this uh, ratio. We have dollars and we have square yards. So this is considered a rate. So just a, a quick little look into what a rate is. So what stores have been doing is been changing their prices from square yards, and notice what I'm doing with it already. I'm setting it up as a uh, fraction ratio, and I'm going to multiply this by something that gets rid of square yards, and they've been changing it into square feet. So here's why they've changed it. Most people know their, um, there's three feet per yard, so they think that the relationship is this, that there's you know three square feet make up one square yard. And therefore, um, 38 divided by three, well, let's see what that is really quickly. It's about 12, 38 divided by three, what? It's 1267. So that would be 1267 per square foot. And what they did was they, they put the price at like $10 per square foot. And people were like, oh, that's a great deal because, you know, 38 divided by 3 is more than 10. So they thought they were saving money. But what's really going on is it's not a 1 to 3 relationship um, because of the idea of area and how to calculate area. Area is, you know, length times width. So if it's one yard by one yard, you get one times one square yard. But if we change our yards into three feet each, then our area is going to be three feet times three feet, better known as nine 
square feet. Okay. So the relationship wasn't 1 to 3, it is 1 to 9. And 38 divided by 9 is $4.22. So when they were, you know, charging $10 per square foot, they were making it more than double the original cost. And this is how, you know, stores work. They, they try to mess you up on measurements because they know a lot of people are not good at converting them. Um, so here we have our uh, square yards are going to cancel. Let's go to orange. And the measurements that are left are dollars in the top, so it'll be dollars. In the bottom, we have square feet, so it would be dollars. And anytime you hit a fraction bar, it's going to say the word per. So this will be dollars per square feet. And then the 38 is in the top, and the 9 is in the bottom. So we're going to get $38 divided by 9 per square foot. Okay. So what did I say, 30, 38 divided by 9, uh, $4.22. So this would change into $4.22 per square foot. And that's what it should have equaled and not the $10 per square foot. So that's how you convert um, square units. You have to be a little bit more cautious. I highly suggest you draw the picture and then their linear relationship, write it out twice, and then multiply them. Let's do another one just real quickly. Uh, let's say we have, for example, um, uh, two square uh, meters, also written as this. Now it's a a lot of people will see this and go 2m squared or 2 meters squared, but it really reads 2 square meters. And let's say we want to find out how many square uh, centimeters there are. Okay, so personally I would draw the square. And we're not going to worry about the 2 square meters. We always do 1 square meter because we're trying to find a relationship. So 1 square meter one square meter gives us this picture. And what we're going to do is try to convert it into centimeters. Now, if I go back a page, this time I want to go back a page. If I have the base, meters, and I want to get to centimeter, I have to move the decimal two times to the um, right. All right. So if I move um, the decimal one two times to the right, that turns into 100. So each one of these is going to equal 100 centimeters. And therefore, we're going to have the area, well, write it out, is equal to 100 centimeters times 100 centimeters for a grand total of 1, 2, 3, 4, 10,000 square centimeters. So for every one square meter, we get 10,000 square centimeters. And here we have two square meters. So that means my final answer is going to be 20,000 square centimeters. Put it in a different color, purple. So this is my final answer. So the relationship between one square meter and square centimeters is 10,000. We're dealing with two of them. Easy enough, multiply by two. So besides square centimeters and uh, square meters or square inches, we could talk about cubic in, uh, measurements. Cubic units. Now, um, cubic units are you know, three-dimensional in nature. It's hard to draw in two dimensions, but I got pretty good at it. When I was bored in class, I would draw three-dimensional objects. Eh, I'm a nerd. So let's say we have uh, one cubic foot. What that means is each one of the dimensions um, for, ooh, 
for volume, it's length times width times height. So what we're looking for, let's go with bright pink, um, and it doesn't matter which one you call which, let's call this one length, this one width, and this one height. All right, so when we multiply those together, we get a cubic measurement. Um, so for instance, this is one cubic foot, so our uh, length is going to be one foot, our width is going to be one foot, and our height is going to be one foot. And when we multiply those together, you know, uh, one foot by one foot by one foot, I can say it quicker than I can write it, we're going to get a volume of one cubic foot. So that's how you would write a cubic foot. Don't read it feet cubed. It's literally read cubic feet. All right, so that's a cubic foot. What if I wanted cubic inches? So uh, one cubic foot equals question mark cubic inches. Well, it's exactly like what we did with the uh, square ones. We're going to replace each one of these one foot with how many inches it is, and there are 12 inches for every foot. So this would be 12 inches, 12 inches, and 12 inches. So we would get the volume is 12 inches by 12 inches by 12 inches is the same thing as one foot by one foot by one foot. All right, so here we get the volume is 12 times 12 times 12, which is 12 to the third power. Kind of gives you a hint how to change things into cubic measurements. This is 12 to the third power inches to the third power, or cubic inches. So here the volume would be 1728. Ah, what the heck is that? 1728 cubic inches is equal to one cubic foot. It's a lot of cubic inches. All right, so let me go back, and I was talking about when the metrics, that it, metrics is much easier to change um, a linear measurement into a volume measurement. And what I meant by that is... If we start off with, um, let's say we have a cubic meter, one cubic meter. It's a big thing. So this would be a cube. And each one of the sides would be one meter in length. So the length, the width, the height. All right, and I want to know how many cubic centimeters. And there's a reason I want to change things into cubic centimeters, is that a cubic centimeter is also known as something else. So let's convert it and then talk about it. All right, so each one of the sides is going to be how many centimeters are in a meter, and there's a hundred centimeters for every meter. Okay, so then my volume here is going to be a hundred centimeters by a hundred centimeters. Oops, I forgot the two zeros. Hundred centimeters times a hundred centimeters. Okay, so then my volume is going to be a one and then one, two, three, four, five, six zeros. One, two, three, four, five, six zeros and our centimeters is now cubic centimeters. So that is one million cubic centimeters is a cubic meter. All right, so what's interesting about a cubic centimeter? Well, a cubic centimeter is the same thing. One cubic centimeter is equal to one milliliter. So it gives us a direct relationship between a linear measurement 
and volume, the liters. All right, so if there is one cubic centimeter is equal to one milliliter, then a million cubic centimeters is equal to a million milliliters. So a cubic meter is the same thing as a million milliliters. All right, so now let's go to our, I forgot. Uh, no, no, I didn't forget anything. So let's go to our base. And I just need to go to the right. So deci, oops, deci, centi, milli. So I'm here at milliliters, and I want to come back to liters. So that's one, two, three. So I need to move the decimal three places. So if I move it three places, I get a thousand liters. And I'll write the word. So one cubic meter is equal to a thousand liters. So that's the cool thing about the metric system is a cubic meter is talking about a meter by a meter by a meter. They're all linear measurements, but liters is talking about a volume measurement. So there's a direct relationship here. And that's why the metric system is so much better. Oh, there is one more relationship. If we have pure water, then one cubic centimeter of pure water is equal to one gram. So that gives us a relationship between volume and mass, which is still kind of cool. Oh, and by the way, one cubic centimeter is the same thing as one milliliter of pure water. It is about one gram. Let's do a, a quick breakdown of time. So I'm going to start off with one year. Now, one year could equal 365 days, technically 365 and a quarter. Um, that's what leap year takes care of. Um, one year is approximately... Um, 52 weeks. One year is the same thing as 12 months. The problem with that one is months have different number of days in them. Uh, calendars are weird. All right, so those are the, the measurements that we're going to associate with a year. Now, those come in really handy uh, later in the semester. We're in, in module three. Um, so the other ones that we're going to take care of, of course, is, you know, one week is seven days and blah, blah, blah. But if we have one day, that's equal to 24 hours. If you have one hour, it's equal to 60 minutes. If you have one um, minute, it's equal to 60 seconds. So some of my conversions are going to be converting... Um, say, hour down to seconds, um, sometimes days into minutes, you know, just for fun. So, for example, let's talk about driving a car. So if you're doing 55 miles per hour, nice little highway outside of town, my question is, um, how many feet per second is that? And the reason you might want to change that into feet per second is uh, being a mathematician and having people drive really close to my back end um, while I'm driving. In my head, I'm going through um, the idea of if I have to slam on my brake, they're going to hit me. And I know this because I understand what this calculation does. So let's start it off. The first thing you have to do is break apart this notation miles per hour. What it really means in our kind of notation is miles in the top and hours in the bottom. That literally is miles per hour. And it is 55 miles per hour that we have, we're working with. So I'm gonna to need to multiply that by something that gets rid of, uh, well, we have a double thing going on here. We're changing miles into feet and we're changing hours into seconds. Mm. I'm going a little crazy today. Okay, so let's get rid of miles first. Why not? So we'll put miles in the bottom, and I need to change that into um, feet. Now, you can go back to the chart, um, but this is one I've memorized. It is 5280 feet for every single one mile. So that will be our conversion fraction. 
So let me start canceling things out now. So the miles is now gone, and we are in feet in the top per hour in the bottom. So we're doing feet per hour. All right, so next up is changing. Notice what I'm going to do here. I'm just going to chain it. Um, what I need to get rid of is this hours down here. So I'll put hours in the top because I want them to cancel. I need them on opposite sides of the fraction. And I can change hours into minutes pretty quickly. If you know how many seconds are in an hour, that's great. Most people don't. So for every one hour, there are 60 minutes. And then up to this point, we have now gotten rid of the hours. And we are in feet per minute. Feet in the numerator, minute in the denominator. So that's feet per minute. All right, so I'm going to multiply by um, something to get rid of the minutes because I'm really going for seconds. And for every minute, there are 60 seconds. So up to this point, now we have gotten rid of, gotten rid of um, minutes. So now we are at feet per second. It's the only units of measures left over, and that's what I wanted. So this is the calculation I need to do. So the calculation I need to do is every number in the top I'm going to multiply, and every number in the bottom I'm going to divide. So on a calculator, you really can just type this in. Um, I'll put a time sign here. Times 5280, divide by 60, divide by 60, and it will give you the right answer. A lot of people aren't comfortable with two division signs, but in this case it actually works out well. It's the order of operations of multiplication division. They have the same order, so it doesn't matter if you um, do them out of order, or in order for that matter. Times 5280 divided by 60 divided by 60. So it's 80.7. So this turns out to be 80.7. And remember, our measurements now are feet per second. So this is why I get really nervous when people are within 80 feet of my back bumper. If I slam on my brakes, it generally takes people a second and a half to two seconds to even take their foot from the gas pedal, you know, realize what's going on, change their foot from the gas pedal, slam on the brake. So that's already hitting me. And then even if they were really, really quick, there is the skid factor that they would probably still run into me. So 55 miles per hour is the same thing as traveling 80.7 feet every single second.